Welcome to our War Within Unholy Death Knight starter video. Whether you're a veteran player eager to get ahead in the new expansion, or just curious about the latest changes for Unholy Death Knights, this video is for you. We'll cover everything you need to hit the ground running, including a look at what's new for Death Knights in War Within, the top talent choices, the best gear loadouts, the most optimal races, and as a bonus, we'll also include some essential macros you won't want to be without. And if you're ready to dominate in the War Within, our brand new update to the skill capped add-on has just dropped giving Skillcap members the best UI for PvP with just one click. We've partnered with the world's best players to ensure the Skillcap UI is ready for every class in the War Within, and to bring you exclusive guides that unlock the full potential of your class. From maximizing damage to perfecting crowd control and outsmarting opponents with the latest tech, we've got you covered. While everyone else is confused, you can instantly get ahead of the curve with our guides, designed to fast track your progress and put you miles ahead of the competition. We're even so confident in our service that we guarantee you'll gain at least 400 rating or you'll get your money back. So why wait? Click the link in the description below and join Skillcap today. To start things off, let's discuss how Unholy Death Knights are looking in the War Within, starting with what is new. Overall, Unholy Death Knights have access to a similar toolkit they had in Dragonflight. We've kept all the same utility and flavor that brings players to this spec in the first place. A majority of what's new for this spec is about how we are able to dish out our damage, but as we continue to throw out our festering wounds on our targets and summon our army of minions, this doesn't apply as much to what we are already accustomed to. The most significant change is that Unholy Death Knight completely deviates from the Brawling Warrior archetype, as we rely heavily on buff and disease maintenance, as well as a majority of our burst focusing on Death Coil. We also receive another dramatic change for one of our most iconic abilities, Abomination Limb, which is more of a soft lock talent now, as it now gives us zero rune regeneration, and with it now being limited to gripping each player once per use, it's more of a gap closer than a damage cooldown. Continuing onward with our class talent tree changes, we also receive some nice quality of life improvements towards our survivability as we gain access to both null magic and runic protection. Alongside this, we receive a completely new talent, Vestigial Shell, as another way to apply anti-magic shell outside of Spell Warden onto two nearby allies once anti-magic shell has been used, as long as it doesn't hit our pets, that is, resulting in DKs becoming the ultimate counter into all caster comps. So while our Death Knight and Unholy Talent trees have been completely revamped, changing up our node positioning and talent point allocation, the main focal point of the War Within, and where most of the new stuff really comes from, is from the introduction of what's called Hero Talents, with every class having two Hero Talent trees to choose from. For Unholy Death Knights, this is Rider of the Apocalypse and San Lane. Rider of the Apocalypse will be your default hero talent tree, strengthening your direct burst while enhancing our uptime and mobility on our selected targets. The centerpiece of this hero talent tree is Rider's Champion, creating quite the immersive feel as this focuses so heavily on class fantasy. As we now have the chance whenever we spend our runes to summon one of the four horsemen, with each horseman providing their own unique effect. There are two horsemen that provide the most notable effects, which are Mograine and Trollbane. When Mograine is summoned, he applies a death and decay beneath him, as this ability moves with him wherever he chooses to go. Providing us a passive 5% damage buff and any additional effects in our class and spec trees from our node below. Meaning that we receive more uptime on Unholy Ground for increased haste and cleaving strikes for more cleave action whenever we stand in it. This allows us to burst our festering wounds with scourge strikes efficiently, making our buff maintenance slightly easier in regard to fester might for some added strength. For our second horseman, we have Trollbane, who applies Chains of Ice on our current target, allowing us to put forth more globals on our diseases and scourge strikes to overwhelm our potential kill target. As for the other two horsemen, these provide more damage to our rotation without any specific mechanics. Now, if this wasn't exciting enough, wait until you see our capstone node. Apocalypse Now, allowing us to summon all four horsemen whenever we use Army of the Dead or Ray's Abomination. You'll almost always use these as quickly as possible once the game starts, as we greatly benefit from Feast of the Souls to increase our damage coming from our spenders, especially Death Coil, as long as two horsemen are currently active. In caster-heavy solo shuffle lobbies, this spec truly shines, effortlessly topping the damage charts thanks to our buffs to Death Coil and our increased survivability against magic damage. Not to mention, Rider of the Apocalypse grants us access to Death's Charge, which replaces Death's Advance, making our mobility so much better as we are now able to break out of roots. This massively reduces the chances of us not connecting whenever we have our mobility spells off cooldown. 
The second hero talent tree, Sam Lane, is drastically different. While Rider of the Apocalypse focuses on enhancing our burst, Sam Lane is all about survivability. Ultimately, our recommended default as we enter into the new expansion will be from our Rider of the Apocalypse hero tree, as we receive way better enhancements to both our direct burst and mobility to further apply our diseases and reap the benefits from it. But now that we have a basic understanding of what these trees offer, it's time to delve deeper and discuss how to best allocate our new hero talent points. Before we get into it though, we just wanted to remind you about our free articles site which has been updated for The War Within. As always, with the start of the new expansion, things can quickly change, so we'll be keeping all the information found in this guide up to date in our article, and have also included talent import strings there, so be sure to visit the link in the description after this. Alright, let's get back into the video. Starting off with Rider of the Apocalypse. On the left side of the tree, the first choice you're met with is on a paler horse, or death charge. To which the latter seems like a no-brainer here. We receive way more movement speed and on top of that can break out of roots upon activation, giving us even more immersion of being one of the Lich King's henchmen. Down below we have White Mane's Famine, further boosting how much damage and spread pressure we can apply with Undeath after casted on our target by White Mane herself. And for our last node on the left side, we have Hungering Thirst, further amplifying our disease and death coil damage. Synergizing amazingly with our node directly aside, a Feast of Souls for even more death coil burst. Going down the middle, we then have Mograine's Might, and as explained previously, you'll be more inclined to play around Mograine's Death and Decay for a nice added damage boost to all spells. Then we have Nazgrim's Conquest, catering towards more of a PvE buff as the only way to benefit out of this is by luckily summoning Nazgrim at the right time whenever pets or minions are about to die, and in most cases you will rarely receive benefit out of this. Moving over to the right of the tree now, we have yet another choice node, Horseman's Aid or Pact of the Apocalypse. Horseman's Aid was recently nerfed with a huge PvP modifier, which now makes Pact of the Apocalypse the more preferred option, being great into most matchups. You could still play Horseman's Aid into double caster, but will see dramatically less benefits. Next up, we have some solid enhancements to our Trollbane Horseman, as Scourge Strike now shatters his chains of ice for some extra spread pressure, snaring all nearby targets. As our final talent on the right side of the tree, we have Mossworn Menace, giving us a passive damage increase to our Scourge Strike, as well as providing us with more death and decay uptime. Finally, the end capstone for Rider of the Apocalypse is Apocalypse Now. Similar to what we covered earlier, this is what enables you to summon all four horsemen at the same time whenever we press either Army of the Dead or Ray's Abomination. You'll want to press these as soon as possible, providing us with more uptime on Feast of Souls to empower our single target burst. And remember, you can find exclusive tips in our brand new class courses at skillcap.com, where we'll be releasing new guides every week throughout the War Within. Skillcap members can also unlock premium profiles ready for the War Within in the Skillcapped add-on, so don't miss out. Use the link in the description to start gaining rating today. Alright, with the new additions covered, let's quickly go over what we are currently suggesting for your Unholy and Death Knight talent trees. Now, as you can see, we have experienced a drastic change towards node positioning and talent point allocation, resulting in a bit of change on what we choose to select. With what's on the Death Knight side of the tree being a good default setup for both Rider of the Apocalypse and Sand Lane. Briefly touching on the highlights here, over on the Death Knight side of the tree, we have Blinding Sleet as an AoE blind effect, allowing you to easily set up burst windows or to peel for your allies by pairing this with Death Grip. Cleaving Strikes in combination with Unholy Ground to land some massive cleave on targets while in Death and Decay. Anti-Magic Zone to negate a solid portion of magic damage whenever you or allies stay inside of it. And our must-have Death's Echo for an additional charge in our primary utility spells, as well as Death and Decay for more cleave action. Directing our attention on the Unholy side, we notice a large amount of change with what's on screen now being the suggested default talents for Rider of the Apocalypse. Now as a whole, some of the major highlights here are a variety of disease talents that heavily supplement our burst damage. To learn more about your optional talents and to see more builds, be sure to check out our articles page. The final step in setting up our talent loadout is discussing PvP talents. We also experienced a bit of change from what we are typically used to seeing in our selection of PvP talents, as Necrotic Aura has been completely removed as one of our potential picks, and with this being one of our hard-locked PvP talents, we now open up to more potential picks depending on the matchup at hand. Additionally, Strangulate now replaces our Asphyxiate, heavily nerfing the amount of control our toolkit provides. Now, for our current loadout, we have two talents that never really change, Necrotic Wounds and Doom Burst. Necrotic Wounds is more of a pseudo-mortal strike effect, as this can also stack its effect on other mortal strike effects. 
On the other hand, we have Doom Burst, buffing our death coil furthermore whenever we proc Sudden Doom. This allows us to explode two additional wounds on the selected target, while also reducing their movement speed up to 90% for 3 seconds, depending on how many wounds you explode resulting in even more wind conditions from this effect, and by having a more efficient way of bursting our wounds, this allows us to heavily focus on our damage rotation with applying diseases. We're then left with one or two extra slots, with those choices being based on the matchup at hand. Strangulate is a promising option if your team already provides enough stuns, granting you access to a separate CC located on the Silence DR. Blood-forged armor should be picked into melee cleaves that prioritize you as a target, adding some variance in your toolkit as this provides you with some solid damage reduction whenever you use Death Strike. Dark Simulacrum can be a complete game-changer of a spell if you are more of an experienced player, as you can end up stealing some important defensives or CC from enemy casters. Spell Warden is a promising pick as our toolkit synergizes quite nicely with Anti-Magic Shell, and is commonly picked if you're facing a comp that is comprised of a lot of CC or heavy magic damage. This gives you the opportunity to prevent incoming control and burst by applying it on your teammate while also having it on a reduced cooldown. Overall though, if you don't have a clear choice in mind for this third slot, we suggest just picking up Necromancer's Bargain, as you can never go wrong with free damage on Apocalypse. Alright, now that we understand the optimal talent choices and the reasoning behind them, the next goal is setting up our character. The first step in this process is going to be deciding on a race. The first and most highly suggested option is Dark Iron Dwarf. As its primary racial, Fire Blood buffs us defensively for a way to dispel poison, disease, curse, magic, and bleed effects off ourselves, while also adding onto our primary stat depending on how many debuffs we get rid of, reacting similar to our on-use trinket to completely counter-pressure our selected target. And in case you don't have this allied race unlocked, you could substitute this pick for Dwarf, favoring more towards defense as Stone Form keeps Fire Blood's debuff removal effect, but also reduces 10% extra damage taken for 8 seconds. For players that want an easier alternative, Orc still makes its way as a promising contender, granting us Blood Fury as a flat on-use buff to our primary stat, always scaling the best at the beginning of every expansion. Also, going Orc grants you access to Hardiness for some nice stun reduction that shouldn't be scoffed at if Sub Rogues become the new meta. Or if you want to go back to basics, our last alternative pick focuses around choosing Human. And although the racial will to survive has seen some substantial nerfs over the years, it still has its benefits, as you have the option to pick up both an Insignia and Badge while still being able to escape stuns every 3 minutes. Even then though, you can still equip a medallion, it will just put Will to Survive on a 90 second cooldown. Not to mention, going human, you're still going to get access to the human spirit for a little extra boost to secondary stats. With race out of the way, let's take a look at what's shaping up to be your best in slot gear for Season 1. But first, since you'll likely find upgrades along the way, let's discuss stat priority. Our main focus should be on versatility. Versatility is a no-brainer. We receive a solid balance of both offense and defense, and is an excellent stat for PvP overall. Beyond this stat, you'll want to acquire a solid amount of haste. Haste by itself is a great stat to have. It makes us feel a bit less global capped, and because of that, spreading our diseases feels a bit less of a hassle. Aside from haste, you'll want to gain some mastery. This is also important to increase your damage profile, as it buffs your diseases and core damaging spells. And lastly, Critical Strike does not synergize well with our toolkit, meaning you want to avoid this at all costs. As for gear pieces to chase, we currently recommend the two set for our tier pieces, which actually buffs some of our horseman damage and any other minion we summon. Make sure to pick up Helm and Legs for our tier pieces, as they provide the best stats to our stat priority. This is because our four set is quite weak in the new season, meaning that you may want to look at grabbing this later as the season progresses if we receive any buffs to it. However, this may be subject to change, meaning that we recommend checking out our article page for any relevant updates. For the rest of your gear, following our stat priority, we recommend grabbing all of the forged gladiator pieces that offer versatility, mastery, and haste. You'll also be looking to grab crafted gear for your off pieces and weapon to make use of what we recommend as your strongest embellishments. Then for your rings, one will prioritize mastery, while the other focuses on haste. Lastly, for trinkets, prioritize obtaining the insignia and a medallion. If you're playing as a human, you can opt for an insignia instead of the medallion if you prefer. For your cloak, you will want Chant of Burrowing Rapidity. For chest, Crystalline Radiance. Bracers, Chant of Armored Speed. Legs, Stormbound Armor Kit. Boots, Scout's March. And then for your rings, grab Cursed Mastery or Cursed Haste for both, depending on your preference. Finally, the last enchant is for your weapon, where we suggest using Rune of the Fallen Crusader. 
Due to the addition of the Vicious Jeweler setting, you'll now be able to add gems to your helmet, amulet, rings, belt, and bracers. However, in our initial beta testing, you can't add a gem socket to the tier set helmet as of yet. Again, you'll want to check out our article as the season progresses to keep up with the latest information on these choices. One of these can be one of three unique PvP specific gems. Out of these, we highly recommend the Enduring Bloodstone for additional survivability. For the rest of your gem slots, use Master Full Emerald as it provides the best overall boost to your favored stats. And lastly, embellishments will be considered in similar fashion to their Dragonflight counterpart, as these will either be treated as a benefit, your stat priority, or some more flat out raw damage. The best combination for embellishments will be using both Dark Moon Sigil Ascension as your weapon and Writhing Armor Banding on any of your off pieces. This embellishment will give you a nice boost in your secondary stats, further assisting you with your damage profile. But in case these do get nerfed in PvP, expect to look for double Dusk Thread lining on any of your crafted armor pieces, as you can't go wrong with some passive versatility to boost your preferred stats. Finally, let's wrap things up with a look at some must-have macros for Unholy. First, we suggest having focus macros for all your important crowd control, enabling you to CC off targets without the need to deselect your current target. So that's mainly Mind Freeze, Chains of Ice, Death Grip, Gnaw, and Asphyxiate. And for Arena macros, these essentially do the same thing. Although it may seem a bit more difficult to get into than focus macros, this will allow you to effectively apply a spell on any Arena player in a 3v3 game without having to rely on player frames. If you've played Unholy before, you understand that pet management is imperative to optimize your burst and control. These macros featured here make controlling our pet a bit easier, as we have pet attack combined with a few of our primary damaging spells to make sure it is attacking the right target at the right time. Additionally, we have some pet macros for easier defensive play, as the most notable macro is the one you see on the screen now. This requires you to press this macro a second time in order to activate Huddle for a 50% damage reduction, guaranteeing your pet's safety when it becomes the strongest. And if you press Huddle outside of Dark Transformation, our pet becomes stunned for a solid 10 seconds, meaning that you'll only use this in Dark Transformation as it converts into a roar-like effect. We also have a death coil macro directed onto your pet in case you need to throw out some necessary healing to keep it alive. With Spell Warden being a promising pick in our PvP talents, you'll occasionally be throwing anti-magic shell on your teammates to prevent incoming magic CC or whenever they are in danger. One way to streamline this process is with Party 1 and Party 2 macros. If you're unfamiliar with these, Party 1 refers to the person at the top of your party frames, and Party 2 is the second person. The basic way of doing this is what you see on screen now, where you'll need two macros for each ability, exactly like the example you can see on screen now. And lastly, we have some miscellaneous macros that provide some key quality of life improvements to your gameplay. First up is our Death's Advance macro, preventing you from accidentally using it again while it is currently active, as we received two of these from Death's Echo. And surprisingly, a pet taunting macro paired with your Death Strike to guarantee moments where you need some bonus self-healing. Alright guys, that's just about everything you'll ever need to get started in the War Within. And remember this, Skillcapped is the only service that guarantees you'll climb at least 400 rating. We make this promise because skill cap really does work, and if it doesn't work for you, you should not pay. Think of it like a gym membership that guarantees you'll get ripped. Crazy, right? So get started today by clicking on the link in the description. As always, though, we want to thank you all for watching. See you soon.